Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, The Role of Identity in an Operationally Mature Enterprise. My name is Heather Hallenbeck McKenzie, and I am the Director of Communications and Customer Advocacy at Radiant Logic. I'll be your moderator for today's webinar. So, first, a housekeeping note, and then I will introduce you to today's speaker. So if you have any questions, you can reach out via the ask a question button or email info at radiantlogic.com. We love questions and we are happy to answer them and get back to you in a very timely manner. So please go ahead and submit those questions if you have them, if they come up throughout. Um, with that, let's meet our guest speaker. I am very proud to introduce John Horn, the Director of Cybersecurity Practice at Datos Insights. Hey, Heather, it's great to be here. Hey, John. Always good to have you. Um, thanks for, for joining us today. So John leads um, leads the, the cybersecurity practice at Datos Insights, as I said, formerly IT Navarica Group, now Datos. Um, and John provides research insights and advisory services to financial services firms. As an industry expert, John guides a team of two strategic advisors and excels in cybersecurity, information security, and identity domains. And we are very lucky to have him with us today. So thanks again for joining us. Today, we're going to get John's insights on how an identity-first approach can enable greater operational maturity, allowing organizations to move quickly, adapt to change, and get ahead of security threats. So, John, um, with that, I am going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Thanks, Heather. And thanks, everybody, for uh, giving time to this webinar today, whether it's morning, afternoon, evening, whenever, wherever you're consuming it, but thanks for being here. Um, if you've talked with me before, you know I'm a I'm a believer in identity. I believe identity solves much of the world's problems if done well. And where I want to start us today is this slide. Uh, you know, the, there's a couple things in here that may be uh, controversial, but maybe others that are not. Um, the first part seems obvious. Cybersecurity today uh, remains complicated. I don't think anyone's going to argue with me on, on this point. The, the number of attack vectors that are in play in the market, we specialize in in providing consultancy to banks and financial institutions, financial services firms, um, the number of attacks that are coming their way, the number of security domains that are in that the CISO is responsible for, the chief information security officer is responsible for, it grows every year. Every year there's more domains underneath the CISO. And every year the CISO with their board actually has to practically pare down, okay, of these 50 domains, here are the six or seven or maybe 10 that we're going to focus on in the coming year. It's just a very complicated set of attack vectors. It's a complicated set of solutions. Um, and it's a lot of point solutions in the market. Now, I don't think, again, anybody would find that controversial. Maybe the visual on the right might draw someone's ire. I don't know. I'm not really trying to offend anyone. But the other thing I want to start us out with is by saying that today, cybersecurity is fairly uh, immature operationally. And what I mean by that is not that the people, the men and women who are CISOs and their leaders are immature. I don't mean that. And I also don't mean that the, the solutions haven't come a long ways. If you think about the cy cybersecurity um, frameworks and defenses for a financial service firm today, they're orders of magnitude beyond where they were 20 years ago and 10 years ago and even five years ago. There's been a lot of improvements in, in the uh, cybersecurity world and for a practitioner, um, secure ops, you know, SecOps and that whole posture is doing a great job in many institutions today. But if you step back and are willing to hear it, we are not as mature as we need to be. Uh, we still are, are dealing with lots of different, uh, different protection mechanisms, different solutions, different log file aggregators, you know, different sets of alerts that human beings seem to look at. We, we simply are not as operationally mature as we'll need to be downstream to become better for the financial services enterprise, to feel better about us as a society, right? We're just not where we need to be yet. Um, so we're going to look at that a little bit more uh, today. If we, wanna, if we bring that down a notch, um, I want to suggest to you that a cyber North Star one of the guiding lights in the industry needs to be to enable operational mature enterprises. And they may that may sound like going to the dentist to you. It may not sound like it's very interesting, but I think as we dig into it, you'll see the truth in it and you'll see why some of the leading institutions are starting to pivot in this, in this way. The symbol on the right is really about what operational maturity looks like. It just means 
better and faster and smarter. It's it's enabling the business to go faster. Cybersecurity is is typically a drag on the business. It slows down the business, and and many would say, myself included, um, with good reason. But cybersecurity done correctly actually can help speed up the business. And better and smarter uh, deals with intelligence and being able to be faster than we were uh, before. If you look at the left, the, the, the college professor in front of this complicated calculus whiteboard, it seems like but that, that's our world sometimes as a CISO at a financial services firm. And in that world, it's hard to make decisions. It's in that world it's hard to defend against attacks. Um, the world at the bottom left, this simple picture of a, of a light bulb, and we know how, how beautiful simplicity can be, but we also know if you're in cybersecurity, if you've been in it for 30 years like I have, simplicity is hard. Steve Jobs, it was a great statement in 2020 that simplicity came not by ignoring complexity, but by conquering it. And that was the his, his on, the, on the backside of inventing uh, the iPhone. So this this North Star of an operationally mature enterprise, if we can aim ourselves, not just toward what cyber needs, but actually toward what the business needs in terms of operational maturity to go faster, to bring greater intelligence to the ecosystem, and, and even things like being able to help uh, staffing growth re be reduced, have automation that helps staffing, all the right kind of things to include for any uh, strategy as we look into uh, 2024. Uh, let's let's dig into that even, even one more notch, if that's okay. If we wanna break this down, if you're out, you're out there on the webinar today and I haven't got you yet on operational maturity, think of these things for your business. Think of your business being able to move at greater speed and agility. That looks like maybe a, a new business application getting to your consumers in three months instead of nine, in a month and a half instead of four, right? Just being able to move more quickly on business opportunity. The second one is just to be a, a simplifying the IT estate. Many of the CISOs that we advise have very complicated IT estates for mergers and acquisitions of different financial institutions or different, different firms. They have this large sprawling um, IT estate. So simplifying the IT estate, so the business can move faster. And then third, the stronger security assurance. Um, most know in the, in the United States, the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA, uh, that, that was brought to bear by the federal government a couple of years ago, they have a mantra that says, defend now, secure tomorrow. Defend now, secure tomorrow. It's a great, it's a great phrase. It, it captures the mood uh, and where we are in the in the evolution of cybersecurity, because most of us are having to defend now. Stronger security assurance really leans to into that into the secure tomorrow. Actually, have a more stable, robust, mature enterprise that's in a better position to secure and not just be fighting fires and defending all the time. And then finally, another part of operation maturity for the enterprise means their staffing efficiencies. We don't have to hire, the CISO doesn't need to hire a new person every time they buy a new security tool. They don't have, there's just, there's just not appetite for that anymore. So every time a CISO has to, has to add a new security tool, they have to operate it somehow or, or interact with the managed security service provider. But for the ecosystem and the enterprise to actually deliver staffing efficiencies, that, that's the call out to more automation more things that can be done through automation. Um, these are the kind of pursuits uh, for the business that if cybersecurity and, and identity, which we'll talk about, can get behind and aim toward, we can get to the new places in 2024. Let's go to the next slide. This is from a, this slide is from a, a research report that's actually dropping this morning. Coincidentally, this morning, it's a it's called uh, Financial Service CISO's Top Cyber uh, challenges and investment priorities. And again, it's dropping today. Here are the three biggest challenges and, and risk for the financial services CISO. It's from a, a hundred different um, hundred different uh, financial institutions. It's also from our Financial Institution Research Council. It's from our Insure um, Cybersecurity Research Council. These are the three that came to the top. It's defending against new attacks. And, and that may always be true for cybersecurity, 
as we dug into this this first one, if I need to do attacks, it's sort of this aspect that security point solutions have reached their tipping point for CISOs. The CISOs cannot continue to add new solutions every time a new attack vector comes up and that they're looking for different kinds of solutions. We'll talk about that more in just a little bit, but this, this problem of defending against new attacks where you've spent a lot of money on different kinds of cyber defenses, perimeter, endpoint, intrusion detection, all the like, identity uh, phishing-based protections, but in between those solutions, attacks still get through. So CISOs in elevating defending against new attacks are really calling for this new kinds of more robust solutions that either can see more data, better visibility, or can act in a more automated fashion. Again, we believe security point solutions have, have reached their tipping point for many CISOs uh, in the market. Secondly, in the middle is securing the digital workforce. Um, this has actually been the stated number one priority of both our financial institution and our insurer executive cybersecurity councils for two years running. Um, it reflects this post-pandemic world where re work from home, remote work has become uh, the norm, where attackers have figured out how to uh, socially engineer or, or beat employees, sysadmins, right, to be able to get into um, ecosystems. And it involves nine or 10 different components from not just identity, but also things like privileged access management, intrusion detection, uh, VPN or remote access or zero trust network access and, and all the way to identity governance. There's a lot involved in securing digital workforce. It's again, been the stated number one priority now for the second year running. And then thirdly on the right, securing API ecosystems. This is all about, if you're a financial institution, this is all about open banking support. If maybe you're an insurer or a FinTech firm, this is about embedded finance. This is about the open ecosystem and how institutions can partner with fintechs to bring new consumer-oriented, consumer-empowered services to the market. But underneath all of that are APIs. And underneath all that is a very difficult problem to secure API ecosystems. It's the, the number one uh, investment in the United States for CISOs today to help grow their business. So the three, defending against new attacks, securing digital workforce and securing API ecosystems. Those are the three top challenges that CISOs in our research have reflected um, in the market. And when they when we look at when we look at the enabling solutions, they highlight two, right? They highlight digital identity and artificial intelligence. And by that we mean that when they look at digital identity and they look at artificial intelligence, they see the components to help solve these problems, these top three and other problems. So digital identity, I'll show you in some research in a moment, um, it's, it's showing up as a high pain point for uh, financial institutions and financial service firms. And artificial intelligence is similarly um, has gotten a lot of uh, airtime this year. You'd all agree with the, with the splash of generative AI. It didn't show up this year, but certainly made the market splash this year. But CISOs are in a position in our, in our research where they, they can't even show great value yet from their machine learning. And, and so the, the notion of bringing more practical value in artificial intelligence has, has borne out. Here's um, a couple pieces of slide one of the, from the report that drops today. Um, there's two slides. Let me help you kind of see what you're looking at. On the left, this is part of a survey of 221 CISOs worldwide, InfoSec professionals and CISOs, and they were asked, Tell us the domains in your ecosystem that you need the most external help with. And I've used the dotted line box to help, help you see and draw in. It's defending against new attacks, two aspects of identity, uh, digital workforce and transformation and artificial intelligence. As we dug into that graph on the left, um, the second half of the year, it really has been about talent, talent gaps and the need for external expertise that the CISO doesn't often have on his or her staff and the need uh, that they have, they know these, these aspects are important to their business. On the right um, is a different question we asked in the same research piece that asked the same 221 uh, leaders, tell us where you think more market innovation is needed in the market. And it was kind of a sneaky way of getting at, um, what do you wanna buy more of 
but you don't think what's out there is good enough yet. You want to see solutions improve, presumably through innovation. And again, you see AI right at the top of that list. The, and, and as we got underneath that with CISOs, the, the need for more practical value, show me the AI lift, that machine learning component in my endpoint security solution. Show me the quantify the lift I'm getting in my perimeter security with the AI component. Those are hard things to get at with some vendors right now. And then you see identity up there as well in the top, in the top three and four with digital transformation and digital workforce. So again, we believe these are the two key enablers for next year for cyber professionals in the financial services market. We also believe these are the two aspects that help most from an operational maturity perspective. So let's um let's dig into that a little bit. So if we back up and we kind of set all that all that to, all that in the beginning was really to get to this these places. How do we how do we look at identity and how do we help use identity to solve business problems and get to what I'm describing as an operationally mature enterprise? What does that look like? It's hard, by the way, but but we can get there. The the picture on the right is what's called a taxonomy. Some of you are familiar with that, others may not. This is actually a taxonomy we developed last year in 2022. And we used it late last year and this year to help CISOs and identity professionals see all that's going on with identity. Really a lot of this stuff has just shown up, um, some of it just in the last five years. So this has been our way of helping CISOs and executives see that it's more than just the identity stack. Uh, nowadays in the market. There's all this work below the stack, below the platforms in terms of the data uh, data fabric, the identity data fabric. You see elements of orchestration and, and governance, but we've used this to help uh, institutions figure out, okay, here's where I'm strong, here's where I need to invest. But it's a, it's a complicated set of, of concerns. All those lines, all those white lines you see there are traditional sil uh, silos of solutions. They're all traditionally in their own camp, um, they're combined together by some vendors, which is good, but it's a complicated um, set of uh, buying decisions and operational decisions. So when we looked at that, and we've talked about it with CISOs um, all really this last past year, four things, four things have come to mind. One is that CISOs need this elevated identity mindset. If they want operational maturity for their enterprise, and we believe they do, the first thing that has to happen is they have to view identity differently. The old school approach that says identity is a user ID and a password, or maybe it's a token, or maybe even it's even a passkey, something cool and, and FIDO based, but it's a credential to gain access to something. Um, that's the old way of looking at it. The new way of looking at it is identity is an enterprise asset or a cornerstone. It is fundamental to how the enterprise works. It's fundamental to how it operates and it's designed to detect anomalies because we know so many of the successful attacks in the market start with beating and identity. The identity solution has to have this vibe and this wiring to detect behavior anomalies. Many have gotten past number one, but some are still, I'll share in my experience in the market, some are still struggling with how to think in this terms or actually how to get their executive tier on board with thinking about identity is a cornerstone to the business, as a cornerstone um, to the enterprise. Secondly, uh, the big thing is to get to visibility. Uh, most of the uh, institutions, not all, but most of the institutions that we, we help and we serve still see their identity data for employees internal or consumers in a disjointed way. They see part of the enterprise, or they see it in they see that user ID in different expressions in different parts of the application stacks across the enterprise, and that just hamstrings what they're trying to do. So, the the second aspect to get toward an operational mature enterprise is to be able to see all your identity data across the enterprise and across every part where a consumer or a, or an employer or even a partner or a consultant accesses your enterprise. That if you, if you can't secure what you can't see. Uh, visibility is is key to that. Third, identity can really help drive automation. And so we believe, and we've seen, uh, we could talk about a couple of these things in the, in the webinar today. We believe identity done well can improve quality. We think identity done well 
can in some ways eliminate the need for some other compensating controls. And we also think identity done well can help automate things to staff at the at the institution, at the customer, doesn't have to manually do all these tasks. So we believe that identity actually is a great driver for efficiencies if it's implemented well. And then finally, before we kind of dig down a little deeper, we really are beginning to believe much more in platforms over point solutions. And I want to emphasize that again, say it again for emphasis, we really believe in platforms more than point solutions. That means that we, 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 we're seeing this new set of platforms show up in the market that can do multiple things. They can deal with the consumer or the employee's identity from the cradle to the grave, from the beginning to the end, when, to when they start with the firm and to when they exit the firm some, someday. But platforms that can manage the entire life cycle over someone's identity and can bring to bear different parts of the taxonomy, you see that picture on the right, and not just live in a silo. Um, we believe those platforms are going to win the day. Um, and 2024 will be a year where they begin to win even more because CISOs have just kind of at their tipping point with point solutions. So platforms over point solutions. So these four things, uh, we believe that identity done well actually can enable that kind of operation, operationally mature enterprise that can not only help solve uh, cybersecurity risk issues, cyber risk issues, but can actually help the business move faster, um, gain some efficiencies, and and to bring to bring about uh, better security assurances. So as we leave this part here, I want to dig into IGA, Identity Governance Administration, for just a little bit. Um, we we've had in our research councils, we've had um, more CISOs tell us that they have buyer's remorse for IGA than any other component uh, in the ecosystem. So we asked ourselves, why is that? Um, you know, it's an interesting set of problems. And, and you know, we, we, we've we dug into that with CISOs. We've kind of asked, you know, are they, are, they, are they against governance? Are they against the products? Are they, what don't they like about some of these traditional platforms? And, and giving you a couple bullets here on the right, plus these fatigued hikers uh, on a trail somewhere, but they've really, um, the CISOs to a large extent are getting fatigued by long resource intensive projects where they need development. You know, every every other month they need a development effort to, to get an integration done. And so we have CISOs that are three years into their IGA journey um, and they are just not far enough along from their, from their boss's perspective, from their executive sponsor's perspective. Um, it's hard to keep excited, keep getting excited about IGA when it's like a never-ending uh, project. So we've seen that, again, they may not be physically fatigued like the hikers you see in the picture here, but they're just professionally fatigued at having to put so much into this long, never-ending uh, IGA project. They've had to reduce their scopes to get value out of some of these efforts. And, and one of the things that's interesting is this last bullet, that IGA has been kind of held as special and, and all things that we do are important. And I mean, no no uh, shade to throw at uh, vendors of, of this kind of uh, part of the solution for IGA, it's important. But the, the traditional notion is that IGA has been kind of this separate, special thing. And by that, I mean, it's it's optimized into it in itself. And, and that was okay uh, when IGA first came to market, but now there's a, this pressure from CISOs and organizations that IGA needs to be kind of folded in to the overall identity ecosystem. It can't be special. You can't hire a person or two just to manage your IGA deployment. A CISO can't do that. So, so this aspect of being special, and I think a lot of things in cybersecurity um, kind of fit that mold where they were built at a time, they were special, but at some point they have to be kind of smoothed out and just part of the overall ecosystem. So the question I ask in traditional IGA um, enable operational mature enterprises um, if they change. If they change, yes. Uh, but in in many of current states today, they are special and they require lots of staffing um, and they don't really fit the mature enterprise model. So what are we looking for here in, in identity governance? You know, the, the guy, we're, we're doing research on this uh, in 2024, but we've done enough um, secondary research to provide some recommendations now and one of the things with identity government governance as we get into 2024 is to just to recommend to, you know, it's a journey. 
and to hold elevated business expectations. It's just better, faster, smarter. It's just, just hold that. Now, sometimes security professionals are holding more techie expectations, but just being able to hold higher business expectations is becoming more and more important. The second suggestion is think of IGA as a practice, not a project. So think of it as something you have to keep doing, not a project that has a beginning and an end. Things I do in life that I have to keep doing, like mowing my lawn, I think about differently than maybe building a deck to my house, which I would do once. So thinking of IGA less as a project and more as a practice could help many. In fact, we see some in the market that are already kind of pivoting to this practice model. And then finally, in terms of mindset, you know, think about practical value. Operational maturity looks like faster, looks like the business moves faster. looks like I, I can discover things through AI and automation, and I can actually save some resources to hold that unapologetically. You're looking for practical business value. And when you do that, if you bring your eyes down to the light blue at the bottom, I think what you're looking for most here as we, as we go into 2024 is artificial intelligence enabled automation. Um, and maybe in some cases, AI may not be uh, in play, but AI seems to be well suited for that. Generative AI seems well suited for some of this automation where you can discover identity data, where you don't have to know it's there. You don't have to configure it's there with some type of LDAP configuration. You can discover it um, through automation. Similarly, you can detect anomalous behavior, behavior that based on identity shows a user's operating outside their norm or up outside of the role um, norm that they are, they're they supposed to be operating with. You, you can detect that. You can even bring blocking behaviors um, to that uh, type of behavior, or in some places it's maybe it's a gray area, it's surface to a professional to look at. But in some cases, I think anomalous behavior should just be shut down, and then you figure it out after the fact. And the third, creating staffing efficiencies, things that the CISOs, uh, people on their team need to do to operate IGA, to take that out of people's hands and put that into automation's hands. So you're, you're looking for solutions that break down silos, um, that kind of cross over between silos and, and partners with deep acumen. This, um, this identity is hard. Identity governance is hard. Making this more of a platform, making it more holistic across the enterprise to make it more mature for the business, you know, you may not need not need to know those technical details, but your partner does. This is a if you're a swimming metaphor, this is the deep end of the pool. You need to find partners with deep technical acumen. So again, as we head into 2024, identity can be a, a, a key part of what an operationally mature enterprise um, looks like. That's an important part of your business, and this is just an example on identity governance and perhaps how to get there in 2024. Heather, uh, I think it's time to ask me a couple questions. <laughs> yes, it is. Great. Thank you, John. That was really interesting. And, and um, yeah, so that, that does lead into a couple of questions. Um, so operational maturity, as you've described it, I mean, it seems like a pretty straightforward concept. Do you see this approach being used by um, by financial services institutions today? And um, if not, what do, you, what do you observe as holding them back? Yeah, that's a great question. So we see it a little... So we see it in in some institutions that have those creative, you know, critical thinkers in executive roles. They they just see it more as a business approach, and they're driving toward these type of outcomes. But it's it's not the norm. Most are not uh, pursuing this yet. That's why we're thought leading on this front. Uh, and most are held back um, because they're defending all day. If you're a fireman or a firewoman and you're putting out fires all day. Right. That's what a lot of our cyber teams we talk to are doing. It's hard to kind of envision the better kind of house when you're fighting fires all day. So we think that just defending all the time against uh, attacks, some people call it chaos as the norm, that just distracts from kind of thinking about this in a more elevated manner. The other thing is, I think as an industry uh, practitioners, and again, I've been one for quite a while, um, we can get hooked on the shiny toys. Right, the latest attack vector and the latest cool tool that can knock it down. I think cybersecurity as, a, as an industry sometimes gets a little consumed on shiny toys 
this is not shiny toy kind of stuff. This is just getting better and faster and smarter. So I think that many institutions struggle with this as it stands right now. Yeah, so that actually leads into my my next question, which is what would you say to to someone who's uh who's who says something like like yeah this this all sounds great but I'm just trying to keep my company off of the front page I'm trying to do my business is this too lofty of a goal like why why does this need to be a priority Yeah it's a good question too I you know I've been in that position in my career as a pr- practitioner um I, I think that the mindset that says you're always fighting to keep your your firm your institution on the paper is a good one right we don't need to throw shade at that but if we aren't going to improve the ecosystem, then you're never getting out, getting out of that firefighting. Uh, I, again, the, the CISA, uh, kind of the bumper sticker of, you know, defend now, secure tomorrow, it presumes that institutions and firms are going to secure tomorrow, that at some point you've got to put some cycles against strategy and some cycles, some cycles against those strategic hikes. And so, I, you know, I, there's no, no shame in defending your your institution against the tax, but at some point the institution has to carve off uh, some of their people or a couple of their people, or maybe one of their leaders to begin thinking through more strategic um, outcomes or else they'll be fighting fires the rest of their careers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so we're hearing, and I think you alluded to this at one point that we're hearing across the board that there's a cybersecurity skills gap and a, a digital identity skills gap. There's just not enough people to run the systems that are out there today. So how can organizations address some of these gaps and prioritize maturity when there already feels like they're lacking headcount? Yeah, that's a tough problem, Heather, uh, for sure. And I think, uh, you know, I don't, this isn't meant to be a downer, but I don't, I don't think it's trending in the right direction. And I think we, you know, the gap keeps getting bigger for most institutions, for most financial services firms. Some, some are doing great. Um, but most are not. Most are are year over year seeing a greater gap in what they think they need and what they can hire for, even the even the talent they can find. So I, as I look at this over multiple years or even last decade, I actually think that the trend's going in the wrong direction for the institution, for for the customer, if you will. Um, I, I think it calls for it. It reminds us why the institution needs to seek outside help. It, it's why it needs to partner. Um, institutions that want to build everything themselves, um, that's usually a recipe for uh, for, for bad things. So I, the, the skills gap, um, we could watch the skills gap numbers year over year. We can debate the nuances in the skills gap. Well, are we, you know, you've seen a lot of things. Well, it's not that high. Oh, well, it's lower, no, it's higher. But really, it really calls for the, financial services firm and really any business to partner with experts, to partner with identity experts, to partner with cyber experts. That uh, It really calls for that because the trend of the gaps is actually going in the wrong direction. So um, I, I, kind of touching on the slide that you're showing right now, um, the kinds of identity governance solutions that that you're recommending and and that are filling some of the gaps that we're observing and that you described, do you see these solutions emerging in the market now? Yes, I'm starting to. Yes, um, I'd be remiss not to say I think Radiant Logic's got one of these kind of uh, solutions, right? It's crossing that boundary between data fabric, identity data fabric, and, and identity governance. I mean, those are the kinds of solutions in the market that can change the way. A, a business can actually approach identity governance. So yeah, I do think they're emerging in the market. I think that as um, as CISOs continue to bring their kind of their pain toward their current vendors or look toward other ones, I think the market will recalibrate. I think IGA has kind of found its maybe extreme position and now it's going to come back to be more a little more practically valuable and not just audit and compliance driven. So yes, there are solutions and that gives me encouragement that the market really can take off in this new season uh, for IGA, which is just more practical and more operationally mature. I mean, as as an identity practitioner, so someone who's been in this space for a long time, do you feel like identity is kind of having a moment? Like, is it? It, it feels like I'm hearing we're hearing a lot more about identity to rule in um, in the enterprise than we have in the past. So I'm, I'm curious what your take is on that. 
So you said I've been here for a long time. I think you just called me old, but we'll um, <laughs> we'll talk about you didn't that, say that. Didn't another say that. time. Well, it's, it's kind of true. <laughs> um, but all that kidding aside, I do think identity's having its moment. I think when the CEO of RSA got up at not this year's conference, but last year's conference and said identity is the only you know constant in the world of cybersecurity, I think the market is getting it. I think the challenge is it's hard still to do. Knowing that identity is important is actually not enough, right? You've got to, so I think there's an unprecedented view of the importance of digital identity done well in the market right now. What we see practitioners struggling with is who to partner with to actually get this done. But we we do think the market's in that identity moment right now. Now it's about finding the right people to work with from a practitioner standpoint. Um, yeah, absolutely. Agreed. Uh, last question. If for someone who's watching today, do you have one recommendation you'd want to make for them to pursue one, one takeaway, one, one recommendation for them to pursue an improved um, kind of IGA and, and what would that recommendation be? If I could do two, if okay. you'll allow me two. Sure. Awesome. So the first thing I would say to someone on the webinar today, besides thanks for being here, is help your executives not try to understand identity, but understand what identity can do for the business. There's a big difference. Your executives need to understand what identity can do for the business. They need to have partners that care deeply about identity, but executives don't need to know deeply about identity. They need to know what identity can do for the business. And then for the folks you know that are looking for how to get on this journey, I really think it's about the automation. I, I, I think that seeing your identity data across the enterprise and having it be a trigger for anomalous behavior and not having to pre-configure or know where all that lives, but let it be discovered, that's like a whole new place. So I, if you if you lean that into your current IGA vendor or, or discussions with other IGA vendors, if you can get that degree of automation where the where the framework is actually generating intelligence and generating discovery of identity data, that means you're on the right course. There's a lot of good things ahead. Great. Well, John, thank you so much for your time and your insights on today's webinar. And thank you to the audience for listening as well. As a reminder for our listeners, if you have any unanswered questions, you can go ahead and submit those in the ask a question button, or you can email us at info at radiantlogic.com and we'll follow up with a detailed answer. So again, John, thank you for being here. Great to talk with you and um, to all of our listeners. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks. You too, Heather.